working 16 hours a day to finish the project's first phase within a year from now. Well, here in sunny Los Angeles, eating outside on the restaurant's sidewalk or patio is part of the dining out experience. But what you may not know is what it costs restaurant owners to set up those tables and chairs on the sidewalks. But as Anita Bennett tells us, a change in city law could mean more outdoor dining. This ice cream shop on Main Street uses pedal power to make bicycle churned frozen desserts. But the owner says the fees for a sidewalk dining permit nearly put the brakes on his plans to set up tables outside. Before it was just uh, really uh, unaffordable for most of the small businesses that I know of up and down the street. Now that's changing. On November 6th, the city council voted unanimously to slash the amount businesses in the downtown historic district pay for outdoor dining permits. It costs anywhere between $1,500 to $6,000 to simply have a permit to allow for outside dining. So what we did is it's now going to cost more or less about $500 to get the permit and you could get it a lot quicker now. Before it could take up to a year. Now, since inspectors will no longer have to visit each business, most permits will be issued within days. And it's not just restaurants that are affected. Here at the Kurt Darling Hair Salon, they were told they'd have to pay thousands of dollars in fees just to set up this table and chair on the sidewalk. If you just want to provide a place for your patrons to sit and a beautiful planter, it should cost nearly $10,000 to do it. Blair Beston is executive director of the historic downtown business improvement district. She says the beauty salon owner and several others complained about the permit fees. So she took their concerns to City Councilman Wiesar, who represents this area. They came to us and said, why are we being cited uh, when we have our permits? And then others didn't have permits, but they said it's too burdensome to get a permit and too expensive. So we realized something had to get done. The city analyzed the situation and took quick action. Meantime, back at Peddler's Creamery, they welcome the change. To be able to have this uh, opportunity to encourage my customers to sit outside and enjoy the day when it's a cup of ice cream or a cone, um, it, it's a huge relief and uh, we're looking forward to it. In downtown Los Angeles on Main Street, I'm Anita Bennett for LA This Week. There are already plans in the works to expand the program to across the city. When it comes to raising men's cancer awareness, tying a ribbon on the lapel just doesn't seem sufficient enough. A global movement that's made its way to City Hall is prompting men to alter their grooming habits. It's been a hairy month at City Hall, literally, as several council members and city employees grow facial hair to help raise awareness about men's health. It's all part of the Movember movement in the month of November. And as it turns out, facial hair is a great way to start a conversation, encouraging men to get checked out for prostate and testicular cancer. What the Movember movement does is causes us to ask questions. Um, when, we, when somebody sees me wearing this, they're going to ask me, why in the world are you doing that? And it gives me an opportunity to talk about it, the importance of being tested uh, for cancer, uh, because most of the men's cancers are... Uh, so readily treatable if we just make the effort to get early testing. Movember first started in Melbourne, Australia, where a mustache is called a mo. The movement has grown from 30 original participants, or mo bros, to more than a million globally. Councilmember Fuentes, his seventh district stashers, and Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell took the Movember message to the streets when they took part in the Movember mustache dash at Elysian Park on November 17th. Men, for whatever reason, don't attend to their physical and mental needs as well as they should. And we know statistically that men live five years less than women, and there's no biological reason for that. This year, for the first time, the U.S. Movember movement is also focusing on the issue of mental health in addition to cancers. Breaking down the stigmas attached to men not being able to talk to their friends or their family about their issues, whether they be emotional or physical, and going to seek help where they can. That's probably the most important thing that we can do through this campaign, and that's the awareness that the mustache brings to our efforts. In the seven years the Movember movement has been in the U.S., $48 million have been raised for the cause. They risk their lives every day to save others, and now they're being honored for their bravery and courage. Yana Kay takes us to the E Awards. 
LAPD Sergeant Kathleen Ryan goes up on stage to receive the life-saving award for convincing a man not to commit suicide. Very proud, very proud, Ex excited to be here. It's a beautiful event and I have my family here with me and they're very proud of me and excited. Ryan was one of a handful of public safety personnel who were honored at the annual luncheon held in Granada Hills. Family, friends and city officials including Mayor Eric Garcetti gathered to recognize and honor police officers, firefighters, paramedics and school police for all of their heroic efforts to maintain public safety. We are a safer community because of all the true first responders and heroes we've got here today. Officer Elizabeth Lara of the Los Angeles School Police also received her E Award for excellence in public safety. This year's E Awards are a continuation of a long tradition of recognizing public safety heroes who have shown an unwavering dedication to their careers. One honoree has been with the LAFD for 35 years. It's just an honor to be here and, and thank you for the, the recognition. A recognition that is well deserved. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. The awards were first started by former council member of the 12th District, Hal Burnson, and continued by former council members Greg Smith and Dennis Zine. Some of the sleekest, greenest vehicles for 2014 are being unveiled at this week's LA Auto Show. As Gil Reyes reports, some major automakers tell us why they believe their cars are best suited for driving the streets of LA. We'll get to the serious eye candy in a minute, but first let's talk practicality. Ford Motor Company unveils its Lincoln MKC, its first compact luxury crossover, and at around 30 grand, it comes with a new technological feature that will help LA drivers safely squeeze into those tight, hard to find spaces. For example, we offer park out assist, which means not only can the car guide you into a space, but it now can help guide you out of a space. It is one of over 20 world premieres at this year's LA Auto Show at the LA Convention Center. Also debuting, Chevrolet's Colorado midsize pickup. When local gas prices go up, know the Colorado has the best fuel economy of any midsize vehicle. Price tag also around 30 grand. We find midsize customers often use a vehicle to commute during the week and then use it for recreational activities or home, around home activities on the weekend. And, you know, midsize pickup is perfect for that. And we think the Colorado is a, be a great choice for people in Los Angeles. For you movie star types with money to spare, here's the Jaguar F-Type Coupe. Price tag around 99 grand. Also the Mercedes AMG GT, which actually starred in the Gran Turismo 6 racing game for PlayStation 3. LA Mayor Eric Garcetti welcomes them all. We look forward to many, many more years of, yes, embracing the fact that we are the car capital of the world, but showing people that that title brings with it a leadership responsibility. And in a city that takes great pride in at least trying to become more environmentally friendly, special kudos go out to the Honda Accord, named 2014's Green Car of the Year. Accord is a very diverse lineup. You know, we have a coupe, we have sedan, we have a plug-in hybrid, and then right behind us here is the 50 mile per gallon Accord hybrid. So whether you're after fuel efficiency or pure fantasy, you'll likely find something to rev your engine at the LA Convention Center. Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. The L.A. Auto Show takes place at the L.A. Convention Center through December 1st. We'll have more details also later in Things to Do. Police are asking anyone who may have been victimized by a registered sex offender targeting teen girls and women to come forward. More personnel change this time at the port, and a cousin of the giraffe welcomes a baby for the first time at the L.A. Zoo. North Hollywood detectives have arrested 30-year-old Irvine Perez, who they say committed sexual battery against women in the San Fernando Valley. Authorities say Perez, who is a registered sex offender, would exit his car, grope his victims or expose himself to them, and flee. During these assaults, Perez was driving a 2006 gray Nissan Xterra SUV. We're asking students to be vigilant. And if walking to school, should consider walking in pairs because we truly believe in safety in numbers. If you believe you have also been victimized by Perez, you are asked to contact the LAPD. Gary Lee Moore, who has served as Los Angeles City Engineer and General Manager of the city's Bureau of Engineering for the past decade, has started his duties as Interim Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles. 
Moore was appointed to the post by Mayor Eric Garcetti. Moore replaces Geraldine Natz, who served as the port's executive director for almost eight years before announcing her retirement in October. Moore's first order of business will be a trip to Japan, where he will meet with Japanese customers and port officials. The hats flew in the air as yet another class of recruits joined the ranks of the LAPD. Police Chief Charlie Beck talked to the graduates about the importance of maintaining the public's trust as they go out into LA streets. We do not maintain order and enforce the law solely through strength of arms. We maintain it through the willing cooperation of the vast majority of this population. And in every contact you make, Every person you talk to, you have to remember that. This graduating class has five females among the 41 graduating officers, and close to half are Hispanic. The Los Angeles Zoo recently announced its first ever Okapi birth at the end of August. The male calf was born on August 26th at 9 a.m. to first-time parents, Father Jamal and Mother Baraka. It spent the last couple of months behind the scenes, but is now out in his habitat daily, weather permitting. While an okapi may look somewhat like a zebra due to the black and white stripe patterns on its front and hind legs, the species found in Central Africa is actually the closest living relative to the giraffe. Some young Marines who passed through the Los Angeles International Airport got an early holiday surprise. Rasha Goel takes us to a meal they won't soon forget. It's one of the best meals they'll probably have for quite some time, and a memorable one. About 300 Marines who recently graduated from the School of Infantry from Camp Pendleton were treated to a feast at the Bob Hope United Service Organization's 8th Annual Thanksgiving Dinner at LAX. It was very heartwarming because this is a great meal that we got in a long time. So it was very nice for the USO and everybody else to put this on for us. Today is the first day of the rest of their life in the Marine Corps. They are going to places from here as close as 29 Palms, California, or as far away as maybe Germany, Okinawa, or maybe even Afghanistan. The event was hosted by the United Service Organization, or USO, a nonprofit organization which helps lift the spirits and morale of American troops and their families. Mayor Eric Garcetti, who is also a lieutenant in the United States Navy Reserve, has himself experienced the generosity of the USO. I've certainly been a, a proud recipient of USO hospitality across this country and around the world when I've uh, deployed, when I've been out there. It is like meeting an old friend. You just see that sign when you're walking through an airport or when you land someplace, you say, where's the USO? And you know it's like coming home to family. This dinner was even more unique as the Marines also had the honor of being served food by the mayor himself. When a lot of these uh, Marines won't have any meal like this before they head off, it's our way of saying thanks. We're still a nation at war. It's a great way of us giving back. It's just uh, a lot of people to, to thank for their service today, as well as the troops who we're thanking for, for doing everything they're doing for our country. The United Service Organization has been around since 1941 and could always use more volunteers to help give back to those who are giving so much. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. For more information on how to donate or become a volunteer at the USO here in Los Angeles, log on to bobhopeuso.com. And it's one of the largest holiday turkey giveaways here in the L.A. area. Anna Marcos takes us to the North Valley, where close to 3,000 big birds were given out. You want to try to carry this? It's pretty heavy. <laughs> Council member Mitch Englander helped hand out some of the 2,800 turkeys, complete with all the trimmings at this giveaway. The North Valley Family YMCA put on the turkey drive to help needy families over the holidays. When you know that you're making a difference in somebody's life, my Thanksgiving now, when I'm sitting with my family, I'll know that there's <laughs> almost 3,000 families enjoying a Thanksgiving dinner that they otherwise wouldn't have had. It was a full house at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church where the turkey drive took place. There were turkeys in carts, turkeys in boxes, turkeys on tables, along with recyclable bags full of all that other stuff that goes with turkey dinner. This is Gratitude Month, and I'm very grateful that uh, the church is having this for the community and for the people that really need it. I'm here to pass on my basket to my neighbor. The YMCA started the giveaway five years ago with only 50 birds to hand out. 
Organizers are thrilled they are now helping 2,800 families celebrate the turkey holiday. Very happy. You can see that on my face. So it's growing. That's the biggest thing. And I love it when people, we can help our people. For some of those people, turkey will be just the first course. And some tamales there and enchiladas, you know, it helps a lot. It has shaped up to be the most successful year yet for one of the largest turkey giveaways in the Southland. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. And if the turkeys didn't convince you, you know the holidays are upon us when Pershing Square opens downtown on ice. This marks the 16th year of the popular outdoor ice skating rink. Breaking the ice has never been so much fun. The 16th year of the Department of Recreation and Parks' downtown on ice at Pershing Square kicked off with the chiseling and breaking of a snowflake ice sculpture to christen the skating season. Skating performances by the LA Ice Theater entertained students from inner city youths who were invited to be the first patrons to grace the ice for the season. For some of these children, it's their first time ice skating. And these children are the ones from our school that scored advanced on the California State Test. So this is kind of a reward for them. And who better than two-time Olympic champion and four-time world champion Oksana Grishuk to hold their hands and guide them along the ice. I talked to some of the kids there that I skated with and I said, how do you feel? How do you like it here? And they're all like, oh, it's so great. We feel very happy and want to come back again. And Downtown on Ice is happy to welcome back new and old patrons for this unique Los Angeles outdoor skating experience. We are ready for winter. We have ice skating seven days a week. We have the winter concert series with great fun music events. Snoopy will be down to visit. So if you live in or are visiting Los Angeles this holiday season, lace up those skates and hit the ice. And in this week's list of things to do, we give you more details on Downtown on Ice and on a free sneak performance also at the ice rink, as well as the LA Auto Show. Downtown on Ice at Pershing Square is again open for skating this holiday season. In fact, it'll be open daily from now until January 20th. The hours of operation are 11.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mondays through Thursdays and 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Fridays to Sundays. However, the hours will change over Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, so you'll want to check on those hours before heading out. Go to PershingSquareIceRink.com. And Downtown on Ice will also host several special events this year, including a 15-minute preview of It's Christmas Snoopy on Ice on Tuesday, December 3rd. The free mini sneak preview performance starts at 4 p.m. at the Downtown on Ice rink, which is located at Pershing Square at 532 South Olive Street. Snoopy and the cast of the Knott's Berry Farm production will be also joined by guest star Ty Babylonia, a two-time Olympian and world champion. Again, go to PershingSquareIceRink.com for details. The 2013 Los Angeles Auto Show will be open to the public at the Los Angeles Convention Center from Friday, November 22nd to Sunday, December 1st and showcase nearly 100 exotic and classic cars from around the world. You'll get to check out Jaguars, Subarus, Porsche, Audi, Mini, and Maserati, to name a few. More than 20 world debuts are expected at the show and more than two dozen green vehicles. The LA Convention Center is located at 1201 South Figueroa Street. Go to LAAutoshow.com. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you can catch us online at LACityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
911 emergency, operator 271. The city of Los Angeles receives over 2 million 911 calls every year. Hello, I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti. I'm Chief Charlie Beck. A significant number of 911 calls are not emergencies. 911 should be used for emergency calls, such as preservation of life, a crime in progress, prevention of a crime, or a public hazard. If your call is not an emergency, such as a loud party, verbal dispute, public nuisance, or lost or missing property, you can dial 1-877-ASK-LAPD to have the police respond. Remember, call 1-877-ASK-LAPD for non-emergency calls. Los Angeles Police Department, what are you reporting? G'day, Troy McCavin from North Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35, our city, our channel.
Good morning. I want to welcome you to today's uh, council meeting. It is Wednesday, November 27th. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. You are all welcome. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I believe we have a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Bloomingfield, Bonham, Buscano, Cedillo, Ang, Linda Fuentes, Wizard, Caresco, Corian, Labonte, Martinez, O'Farrell, Parks, Price, Wesson, 10 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. Okay, uh, first order of business. Approval of the minutes. Okay, Mr. Bloomingfield moves, correct, seconds. Next. Mr. President, uh, there are requests to continue item 27 to December 4 and to refer item 48 to the Energy and Environment Committee. Okay, without objection, that'll be the order. Next. Oh, uh, Mr. Fuentes. It's my understanding that we were going to hear item 48 today in council. I thought you wanted that transfer to your... No, uh, when we were here in uh, council and the uh, motion was introduced, Mr. Englander uh, rule 16 the item so that we could hear it today given the urgency of the uh, issues that they're facing at DWP. Okay, so why don't I do that? this? We'll hold it, let me chat with uh, Mitchell, and then we'll hear it today if, if that's uh, the desire. Very good. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, next, uh, Mr. Clerk. M Mr. President, items 1 through 14 are items notice for public hearing. Okay. Uh, did we already approve the uh, resolutions, uh, commendatory resolutions? Uh, we do have them for approval, sir. I'm sorry. So why don't we do that? Very and good. That's moved by Mr. Buscaino and Mr. O'Farrell. Now that should bring us to items uh, 1 through 14. Yes, sir. Do Mr. we Pre have cards? Yes, sir, we do. We have cards on items 1, 3, 10, and 12. Okay. Members, any specials? Seeing none, let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Let's, uh, Mr. Uh, LeBond? One I, I can't hear. Yeah. One through 14. Okay. Yes, that's where we are. Okay, so let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay, yes. Mr. And Mr. Clerk. President, uh, the ORDs for items 13 and 14 will go over one week uh, for a second read, unless reconsidered uh, with 12 members. H however, I do see uh, Councilmember Krikorian is here. So why don't we do it right now? Very good, We're sir. We're at 12, so on those items, Le you want to read those items and then we'll reconsider them and then vote on them again? Very good, sir. Uh, that would be items uh, 13 and 14. We just passed them. Uh, there are two ordinances. Uh, we just passed them 11-0. Okay, so let's vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, now let's actually vote on the items. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, let's move on, Mr. Clerk. Very good, sir. That brings us to items 15 through 34. There are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay. Uh, Mr. Koretz. I'd just like to uh, call 15 special. 15 special for Mr. Koretz. Uh, members, any other specials? Okay, let's prepare to, uh, to vote on these items. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Next section. Items 35 through 49 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, without objection, those items are now before us. Uh, uh, do we have cards? Yes, sir, we do. We have cards on items 37, 38, 41, 43, 44, 45, 46, and 48. Okay, let's vote on the remaining items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay. Now where are we? Mr. Clerk, Mr. That brings President, us. That, that brings us to item 50. It's an item scheduled for closed session. Would you like to hold it on the desk? I'm going to see, uh, want to defer to Mr. Kokorian on this item first. Yes, thank, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The matter's been uh, heard by budget and finance. 
but at least one member has a question, so if I can hold it on the desk for the moment. Uh, the okay, we'll, we shall oh, okay. hold that. You know what, Mr. Mr. President, we've resolved the issue, and uh, we can d uh, dispense with this matter in open session. Bu budget and Finance recommends uh, approval of the City Attorney's recommendations. Okay, Mr. Clerk, you want to read this item? Very good, sir. Uh, in the case entitled Rita Davidson versus City of Los Angeles, there is a recommendation to expand $267,500 in settlement. Mr. Labonte? No question. Anybody here for public works on this issue? On is public somebody works? Here's the question, Mr. City Attorney, on this. It's a trip and fall, right? It's a trip and fall? If, if, any discussion on this should be in closed session. So, Mr. LeBond, let Just us. Just a second question. Mr. Uh, Price, I'll, did you? I'll, I'll, I'll revert. I had a trip and fall question. I'm just not asking specifics, but asking a question about that. It's not about the case. It's about falling on sidewalks. That's all. Well, Mr. President, if you'd like, um, we can reconsider the matter and we can have it heard in President, closed session if President, that's. President, I will talk to the Public Works Board. Thank you. Okay, so let's just vote on it now then. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 and if, aye. And if we could get someone from Public Works to have a chat with Mr. LaBange. Mr. Price? Mr. President, I'd like to get item 40, fourth width. Okay, 44, fourth width. 40, 40, 40. 40. Yes, 40. Item fourth 40, width. please. Thank you. Okay, where are we, Mr. Clerk? Mr. President, that brings us to uh, presentations. Mr. Weezar, would you be ready at this time? For your presentation? Okay, so we'll defer to uh, Mr. Weezar. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. President. And um, I'm very excited to be here today with a great artist a person who started the career here in Los Angeles. And as we look in the audience today and we see men and women dressed in outfits proudly exhibiting the tradition of Mexico known as La Chararia, uh, we may think that it's only Mexican, but in fact, it has become American because like El Nuevo Charo de Mexico, Ezequiel Peña, who's with us here today. A lot of artists are beginning and continuing their careers here in the United States. And it gives me great pleasure today to have in our council chambers El Nuevo Charo de Mexico, Ezequiel Peña. Ezequiel uh, is a great artist with a strong connection to Los Angeles. Uh, there is a great appreciation here in Los Angeles for ranchera music, mariachi music, music with banda. And he continues that tradition here in Los Angeles, which has the most Mexicans second only to Mexico City. He immigrated here from Nayarit, Mexico in 1985 and lived in Bull Heights for nearly eight years performing at the restaurant known as El Mercadito in those early years. Many of my constituents from Bull Heights remember going to El Mercadito to see him perform <laughs> before he hit it big, and we are all very proud of him. He started his professional career at the, with the famous Banda Vallarta show debuting as their vocal, vocalist and quickly becoming one of the most popular Banda members of the 1990s. Ezequiel's time with Banda Vallarta show were among the most memorable and important chapters of his artistic life, motivating him to pursue his dream and passion for music and launch his first album as a soloist in 1995 titled Yo Vendo Unos Ojos Verdes, and the rest is history. He, recorded over, he has recorded since over 38 albums he was nominated for a Latin Grammy in 2007 for Best Album of the Year for his album Mucha Honra. And this year, Ezequiel has performed dozens of shows in the United States where he is accompanied by his son, Ezequiel Peña Jr., who I believe is here with us today. Por favor, un aplauso al hijo de Ezequiel Peña Jr. 
and he is following in his dad's footsteps since the age of seven, and he shares his passion for La Chereria as well. Ezequiel has shared the stage with many great performers, including legends such as Vicente Fernandez, which is one of the biggest Mexican artists. And today, in fact, Ezequiel is wearing one of Vicente Fernandez's outfits, whom he gave to him, and recognizing him as El Nuevo Charo de Mexico. He has also performed with Marco Antonio Solis, Antonio Aguilar, the original Charo de Mexico, and he is currently on tour with John Sebastian, whom he will be performing on November 29th, this Friday, at the Sports Arena. He shares many similarities with the original Charo de Mexico, the great Don Antonio Aguilar, whom we erected a statue at Placita Alvera a few years ago. In fact, he, was, he is named El Nuevo Charo de Mexico by the Federation of Charería of Mexico, and is dedicated, who is dedicated to carry on the great tradition of charo music and love of horses. Like Don Antonio Aguilar, Ezequiel often incorporates horses into his performances. And it is safe to say that Ezequiel is known for two things. One, his love of music and his love of horses. It all adds up to love and deep respect for his Mexican culture and heritage. And family is also very important to him, as you can see by him continuing the tradition with his son, Ezequiel Peña, Jr. We are honored today to show the importance of this day as well by having our Mexican General Counsel of Mexico here, Carlos Sada, bienvenido. Donde está el Consul General de Mexico, bienvenido, señor. We also have with us the Lopez family who continues the tradition of charreria here in Los Angeles with their Pico Rivera Sports Arena and concerts throughout the area. Bienvenido a Don Lopez y su familia. Gracias por continuar la tradición de los charros. And I think we're also joined today by Leo Bueno from Banda Machos, who wanted to be here to see Ezequiel receive this honor before heading out to Aya. Bienvenido, Leo Bueno from Banda Machos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. O está llegando tarde, me dicen. So next year marks the 25th anniversary as a performer, and we wanted to make sure that the city of Los Angeles honors him for continuing this great tradition of Mexico. And we wanted to make sure that we did it here where he got his start in the barrio of Boa Heights. And we wanted to congratulate him on this incredible milestone. Uh, it is my pleasure today to declare November 27th as El Nuevo Charo de Mexico Day in the city of Los Angeles, Ezequiel Peña Day. Felicidades. Okay, now uh, if you could uh, welcome Ezequiel to say a few words. We do need uh, translation, so we will have the translator come up and say a few words. He does speak English, he says, but uh, he prefers to say it in Spanish, so get the real feeling out of what he's saying. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Good morning. Familia, On behalf of all of my family, de todo el equipo, quiero agradecer of all my, my people, ese, I would like to thank you. Esta distinción hacia mi persona. Thank you very much for this great homage and distinction for Estos son los me. homenajes que agradezco. These are the homenages that I truly, truly appreciate because they've truly changed my life. Muchas gracias a Los Ángeles. Y que Dios los bendiga. Thank you very much to all Los Angeles, and may God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you very much. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the presence of Humberto Luna, who was uh, one of the first to receive a Hollywood star, Hollywood uh, uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, uh, Mr. O'Farro, Mr. Labange, as a, a radio personality. He comes from my home state of Zacatecas. Bienvenido, Humberto Luna. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. And last but not least, 
I wouldn't get through today if I didn't acknowledge my mother, who's also here, who, by the way, Ezequiel is her favorite artist. <laughs> and if you would go to her home and you would always hear it playing in the background as she's cooking those great meals or hosting some neighbors in the neighborhood. And um, Mama, aquí está su artista favorito, recibiendo este gran reconocimiento de la ciudad de Los Ángeles. And if I could finish by saying, to be named El Nuevo Charo de Mexico, which is the new Mexican cowboy, is a great honor because El Charo embodies what it is to be Mexican. As these gentlemen wear their, their outfits and uh, provide uh, to the public the, uh, the, the great honor and, and, and pride that we have of being Mexican, to be named El Nuevo Charo de Mexico by not only Antonio Aguilar, the original Charo, but La Charreria de Mexico and all others, it's a great distinction. And to think that this gentleman started at here in Los Angeles, it's something that Los Angeles should be very proud of. He not only has great talents and skills, he's a humble person, and if you see his events and concerts, he's really someone who lends himself to the public, and he's one of us, he's part of the public, uh, it gives me great, great honor to not only say that we have similar um, backgrounds, and I'm from the state of Zacatecas, he's from the state of Nayarit. There's only one thing that uh, I'm not happy about is that Nayarit is close to the ocean that kept Zacatecas from having part of the ocean. <laughs> so anyway, felicidades amigo, Mr. aquí la ciudad de Los Ángeles, estamos muy orgullosos de usted, Mr. felicidades. Mr. Wizar, we have Mr. Fuentes on the queue. Mr. Fuentes. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Wiesar, for bringing in uh, so many amazing people, and Mr. Benya for being here today. I got to tell you, when you watch any one of your videos, they are amazing. But to me, obviously, the song, uh, the meaning, it's all fantastic. But the horsemanship, it seems to me like there's a new horse in every video, and what you can do with them is amazing. So to recognize you as El Nuevo Charo de Mexico is very impressive. And I will just tell you that in my district, it's the most equestrian district in all of Los Angeles. And it used to be that she only had Western and English writers. And now the community is so expansive that you have charros, Western and English writers. And they get together to celebrate horsemanship. And so I want to honor you. Muchas gracias. Felicidades a estar aquí con nosotros. Es un honor tenerlo aquí, señor. Gracias. Thank you. And I think Mr. Fuentes, uh, uh, brought something up which must be mentioned that to continue the tradition of Chararia and the sportsmanship of being on those horses and the skills and talents that they show, it's just amazing what they are able to do. It's an artistic expression that takes a lot of skill and love for what you do. And uh, it great, it's great here that in the city of Los Angeles, now and forever, November 27th, will be known as a Nuevo Charo de Mexico. Felicidades. Gracias. Congratulations. Thank you. Hay que pasar por acá, vamos a ir con la... Mr. Uh, Mr. Englander and Mr. Fuentes, as the room clears, are you okay to proceed with item 40, 48? Okay, we have some, we have three cards on the subject.
Do you are do you want to wait a, for Mr. Nichols or uh, if if he's going to be here? Can we verify that? So let me just take up one other card sure. and let's verify if we're going to get uh, Mr. Nichols here. If you'd give me, I think item three, item three, Mr. Herman, called special by you, Mr. Herman, item three. Mr. Herman, we're on item three. I don't have a card from you, Mr. Dude. Mr. Herman, please come forward. Mr. Herman, if you want to speak, come forward now. Mr. Herman, if you want to speak, come forward now. The sergeant will take care of the business. Mr. Herman, you, you want to speak? Speak right now. Today is a good day in Los Angeles. Once again, under continued consideration of hearing protests of the ordinance first consideration relative to the improvement and maintenance of Van Nuys Boulevard, and Telfer Avenue Lighting District. The importance of lighting is very simple. Lighting is used by all of us, and lighting should be used by all of us, especially when you have homeless people using the lighting when they sleep to protect them and secure them and the safety of overgrown trees and buildings that, that don't have uh, the, gr the, the best lighting as you speak about. But at the same time, we had a gentleman from Encino here talking about how DWP was overcharging all of you. All of you, the taxpayers, yes. The taxpayers are being overcharged by kilowatts based on your area. Now, if you do the engineering and the mathematics of that, you'll figure out that you've been bamboozled and cheated. Again, the fraud of lighting. So again, it's good that we turkeys on Turkey Day celebrate it and enjoy our Thanksgiving. Mr. President, he is not talking about this item. Stay on the City item. City Attorney, this is directed to the speaker, sir. You're interrupting. No, this. stay on the item, Mr. Trying, Herman. That's all we're asking. Stay on the item. I can't concentrate when I'm interrupted. No, if you're not going to stay on the item. The interrupted me. I'm sorry. I'm no, done. if you're not going to stay on the item, then uh, we need to call. Uh, are there any more speakers on this item? Juan Acala. Please come forward. Did you pass? Okay, Mr. Ocala passes. Okay, let's prepare to vote. Mr. Kokorian. I just wanted to make sure the record was clear that every time that Mr. Herman engages in an argument with you or the city attorney, he is disrupting this meeting. He is disrupting this meeting, and he is subject to being removed from uh, entitlement to speak. No, so you that are is exact disruptive behavior that should not be tolerated. You are exactly right, and we will do that for the remainder of the day. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Now we're going to move to item number 12. On item number 12, I have uh, Mr. Walsh and Mr. Herman on item number 12. John Walsh, blogging at Hollywood Highlands, H I G H L A N D S dot org, or J Walsh Confidential. This concerns Trader Joe, Trader Joe's. We need another liquor license. We don't have enough opportunities. It's very inconvenient to buy alcohol in Los Angeles. And the blood of everyone killed by hit and run is on all 15 of you. Of course, it's going to be 15 to nothing. But remember, it isn't just that Trader Joe's wants to sell alcohol. They only want to sell alcohol to white people, Mr. Parks. They only want to sell alcohol to, uh, to white people, Mr. Price. And you damn well know that they won't open a store in your neighborhood. Of course, so all they're interested in is people with my color skin. And if you want to sell out your people, Mr. Price and Mr. Parks, vote for them. There were millions of slaves who did. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Herman. And Mr. Herman, you've been warned. Please stay on the subject matter. So is it right, Los Angeles, for us to continue 
authorizing permits to sell alcohol? Is it okay in Los Angeles to continue to push the license and permit of alcohol in Los Angeles? Because HollywoodHighland.org, Mr. John Walsh, and I don't have to go on and on, is right. It is discrimination, it is racist when you put alcohol in minority poverty areas and then you say we are the wrong people for consuming the alcohol permit and issue is that all of you give, all of you participate in offering to us and you want to call us what? Deadbeat drunks? No. We must provide better resources when it comes to selling permits, Mr. LeBonge, yes, because not all of us fall under the category of alcoholism. And the federal ruling, again, doesn't allow us to discriminate against a speaker who's speaking on topic about alcohol. And alcohol stay, shouldn't be interrupted when a speaker is speaking specifically. Stay on this item. I am. I'm on item no, 12, stay on November 27, 2013. Mr. Herman, just stay on this item. If you cannot stay on this item, then you will not speak. So El Paso Drive, you residents there in El Paso Drive, do you really need more liquor license in your area? Consider holding my time, Mr. Speaker. All right, uh, let's prepare to, is there a card from Mr. Akala on item 12? There's no card for you on item 12, so let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 eyes. Item 37, Mr. Walsh, John Walsh. Item 37. Mr. Walsh, please come forward. Minute two. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. These are uh, installations on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for Paul Mazursky, very well-known director, and also uh, uh, Thalia. Now, Thalia probably sets a record because she probably has the shortest name in the history of the Hollywood Walk of Fame stars. Go out there, it is the shame of Los Angeles. I speak to every tourist. When you come out there, look at the absolute horrible condition of these stars. They're falling apart. When I first came in August 1966 to the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you could eat off it. You could eat off it, it was so beautiful. And now it is garbage, it is filthy, it is unwashed, it is cracking, it is falling apart, it is peeling off. Come LA, come the world to Hollywood and see what a piece of crap the Hollywood Walk of Fame has turned into under these people. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wa. Mr. LeBlanc. And, and, and Mr. City Attorney, in the interest of the hardworking people of the Hollywood bid, who clean and have sidewalk and tax themselves for more street cleaning and including the gentleman with no legs who wipes and cleans and polishes the Walk of Fame. I want to rebuke uh, the last statement. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, prepare to vote. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay, now we're going to move to item 38 which was called uh, special by Mr. Constituent and Juan Acala, item 38. And Mr. President, we have a uh, amending motion, that's 38A, that has been uh, circulated and is now before the council members. Again, that's 38A, motion O'Farrell Buscaino. Okay, Mr. Constituent, please come. Mr. Constituent passes. Mr. Ocala, item 38. Mr. Ocala, item 38. Just come on and speak, every, item 38. I put a card on every item, Mr. LeBron. No, LeBanche. item 38. Now you're speaking on item 38. Consideration of a feral Martinez relative to the accept, uh, donation of fund preparation for the designated banking for mm, humps on Garfield Place, speed bumps. There's too many drunks out on the road, Mr. LeBron. I don't even drink, and I keep 
They keep telling me that, you know, I look like a drunk. In no, the, this, well, uh, stay okay, on the Okay, hold my time. I, I really don't know the item too okay, well. Okay, then, then thank you very hold much. Hold my time, hold Let my time. Let us prepare to vote on the item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, the uh, next item. Okay, now we, we want to go to item number one. I do have one card that there's no name uh, on it. It does, I want to say, say Brown Act, if someone filled that out. And then also I have Juan Acala. So Mr. Herman, is that you on item one? Then come forward and speak on item one. And you have one minute, I'm informed. Item one, hearing protests relative to the Office of the Finance Reports requesting approval of record liens against taxpayers. How many times do we find homeless people on the streets due to ridiculous liens recorded by the Housing Authority? For the record, FBI, all of you who are guilty, I hope the FBI investigates you thoroughly and appropriately for your actions of putting people Mr. in the President, streets he is not talking about this under these, Mr. Herman, would you please stay on this subject? Under this, under this approval of record liens against people, approving the authorizations of finance to record a lien. Do you know what a lien does to a person? It's humiliating because it forces you to pay something that the City of Housing Authority puts against you. Federal ruling Zuma Dog 2012-13 August 7th, Thank you. Federal Thank ruling. you very much. Uh, Mr. Akala on item one. Yes, I am of the same opinion. The cities, the counties, the states do not have any business in basic real estate. People have the right to have a place to live without the city taking it away. Tax liens against people Juan, are Mr. illegal. Mr. Akala, stay on topic. Yeah, well... Okay, I'm trying to give you a break. Stay on topic. I understand, but see, I, that's the argument that I'm okay, making. Okay, if you can't stay on topic... I then, am. ...then no longer... You well, you're will not no letting me... speak on this item. Look... Okay, your time is done. Let's move on and vote what? on this item. Let see us what open you the roll. No, 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 no. You are not speaking towards the item. Okay, let's open the roll. Close the roll. Sergeants, go have a conversation with him. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Next. We have two uh, cards. We're going to move to item number 10. I've got uh, Sean Murphy and Juan Acala on item number 10. Mr. Uh, Herman, you're out of time. Yes. Uh, Number 10. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, I like it when you, ho when you host the uh, meetings. Uh, item 10 is a good item. I support it. Whatever he said, uh, I'm just simply here. Uh, I'm going to talk very slowly about this item, so maybe I will not be interrupted every time. Stay on the item. Yes, against hearing protest, against the proposed improvement and maintenance of the Harbor Boulevard and Melrose Avenue, Street Lighting District. Do you understand what that means? We need better lighting all around the city. Not just there, not anywhere. This city is really crappy. Crappy city. Thank you. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this. Let's uh, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. 
Mr. Englander, do we have your, we want to wait, give a few more minutes? I told he's on his way, but um, we well, let's give him, I, if we you want to go, go through the cards. Let's go a few more, okay. give him a few more minutes. Mr. Koretz, you had an item, item 15, I do have one card on that. Uh, that's uh, Sean Murphy. Please come forward. Yes, item 15. I support this item. It's a good item. Thank you, sir. Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this item uh, would recognize the historic nature of uh, Johnny's Coffee Shop at Wilshire and Fairfax, uh, one of the more notable examples of googie architecture and coffee shop architecture. Designed by Louis Armet and Eldon Davis, uh, both of whom have passed on, but who uh, designed some of the most notable coffee shops in the history of Los Angeles for chains like Norm's, Pan's, Ships. I don't believe any of the ships are still around as well as uh, Big Boy and some of the Denny's as well. This is probably the most notable of all their designs, especially with uh, some amazing uh, flashing lights uh, as part of it. I know that the, uh, the owners want to uh, develop the entire site, but uh, I believe they can do it without harming this location, and uh, I ask that we support this item. Mr. Labange. Join with uh, Mr. Correct, but I want to make a point in the file. Is anyone here from the Cultural Heritage Board or Planning that they have noted that this is the site of the four multi-billion dollar subway expansion and that they work together in all aspects with that because to bring people to this corner will also bring them to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, to the Peterson Museum, to the Craft and Folk Art Museum, to the Page Museum, and all this is very important. So, Mr. Clerk, would you take my words and just friendly amendment to this to make sure they have that in their consideration, that as this is becoming a monument, that there is a note that this site is extremely important to the county of Los Angeles and the subway uh, construction and new subway stop. Do you have a problem with that, Paul, at all? No. It, it's not really re actually re related to But let's the say if I'm item. making you a monument, and you go right now as a monument, just as you look. I just want to tag in how distinguished you are and what you do. That's all. Because right. I, 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 I don't want to be blinded, because I do see, and there's nobody here from the Cultural Heritage Board to stop for this, to stand for this, and I want to make sure it doesn't be a vacant lot, but it's be included in whatever's there as the subway comes. I, I think it would be more appropriate as a standalone motion, a Rule 16, or a motion that gets referred to uh, Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Okay, Mr. Attorney, I'll take your, uh, your uh, suggestion now, but if you're on Wilshire Boulevard, you gotta walk to the museums. You can't take the subway. Thank you, uh, Mr. Labonge. Mr. Koretz, did you wanna close? Well, uh, since Mr. Labonge was uh, adding some things that weren't exactly on, on point. I also want to add one, which is uh, this has been closed as a coffee shop for a while, but I believe that if we can talk the owners into reopening it as a coffee shop, especially when this subway stop is, is finalized, this will be the most successful coffee shop in the history of Los Angeles. With so much going on, uh, uh, the museums, uh, the subway, um, We've seen what happened with Langer's, which was uh, languishing, and the subway actually, I believe, saved that business. Um, and hopefully, uh, it will not only be saved as a property, but will become uh, uh, the, the, again, historic coffee shop that it was. Thank you, uh, Mr. Koretz. Okay, members, let's uh, prepare to vote on this item. Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, now we will uh, move on to item 43, which was held uh, special by cards. I have Mr. John Walsh, Mr. Arnold Sachs, and Juan Acala on item 43.
John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Now, I've told you first about the Hollywood Walk of Fame being in terrible shape. Well, let me charge, there are missing segments on Ventura Boulevard. Whole pieces of the sidewalk gone. However, since the people around there are all white middle class people, we now have an agenda item uh, funding and build out of missing segments of sidewalks. I just want you to know that if you're white, that's all right. If you're brown, you can stick around. But if you're black, stay back, stay back, stay back. That's a song. I want to know why you are repairing Ventura Boulevard and all these cameras here. Go out and pick any star on Hollywood Boulevard. They're all okay, falling this apart. Is, this and, is I, and I'm talking about missing segments of sidewalks on the studio. He's running the meeting, Mr. City Attorney, not you. HollywoodHighlands.org. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Kokorian. I'm happy to provide as simple a response as I can, Mr. Wesson. The simple reason is because the funding source for these sidewalk repairs are very narrowly restricted. They were generated by developers in this area, and they can only be spent in very limited areas, and we're just trying to spend it, to spend it as best we can to improve the sidewalks in that area. That's the reason. Well, that's nice of you to give that explanation. Mr. Sachs, Arnold Sachs, good to see you, Arnold. Yes, thank you. Good morning, sir. And uh, I certainly appreciate that um, explanation also. But again, you know, you have a closed session item. You just uh, paid out $267,000 for a trip and fall on a sidewalk. Imagine that. $267,000 for trip and fall and $163,000 for sidewalk repair. Maybe if you had considered sidewalk repair along with the, I believe it was an inventory you did on roadways, that according to uh, Mr. Buscaino and Mr. Englander, that you did uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, there was an inventory done on the streets and how they were in disrepair and electronic inventory. Maybe you had done the same thing with the sidewalks, you wouldn't be paying out $247,000 for negligence fees and you'd have that money to pay for sidewalk repair. In addition, this special fund, how is it generated? Is it a Quimby t fee type fund that comes from developers? What is the development process for generating those fees? And what about the other districts? What about district number one downtown where they're doing 90 new developments, 90 new buildings in downtown LA? Where is those fees for sidewalk repair? And in other districts, what about in Woodland Hills where they're doing the new development there? Will they get fees for the sidewalks there? And again, we go back to Mr. Cedillo. And thankfully, the million dollars he used for cleaning up his district. Doesn't Mr. Kikorian have a million dollars in his funds from his districts like Mr. Cedillo oh, that he could use for building me. sidewalks and repair? Every district should have that million dollars minimum. And yet, the poorest district had the million dollars to spend on cleaning Thank it up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, uh, Sachs. Uh, Mr. Kerkorian again. I have one more card. Mr. Ocala. And, and Juan, please stay on the subject. Well, uh, that guy is very well informed, you know, and, uh, and he's right. Uh, you're paying more money out on uh, lawsuits to people that uh, are walking uh, uh, on sidewalks that are in disrepair. They're even worse than the streets. Have you ever walked a sidewalk on this city? Even two blocks from here? Man, any little old lady would be afraid to walk the sidewalks. And uh, the city should be afraid of paying huge lawsuits because of the lack of repair. But see, you do not work smart. You work very stupid. And I tell you that about housing and everything no, else. No, stay on the subject. We're talking about sidewalks, so thank you We're for your statement. We're talking about this Miss, thank you for your statement. The city does uh, Sergeant, have a chat with him. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote.
12, 12 eyes. Okay, let's move on to our next item, which was uh, item 41. Uh, we have two uh, speakers on this item. We have Mr. Juan Acala and Mr. John Walsh. So you have one minute, Juan. Come on, on item uh, 41. Item 41, you know, what big difference does it make that you nominate somebody the great charro, the nuevo charro? You know, you got a bunch of homeless people all over stay your city. Stay on the subject. Stay I on know, the, I know. But, but stay on the subject. I like Juan, Mexican music. stay on the subject today. I like so Mexican go your, music. Go take your seat. I go like take the your seat. Sergeants, help me. When you hear it, I'm struggling, help him find his seat. Okay, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh passes. Let's prepare to vote. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Item 45, we have three. Mr. Price, did you? We had item 45, we had three uh, cards. We do have uh, Mr. Akala. Okay, Mr. Akala's out of time. Okay, Mr. Herman is out of time. Mr. Walsh still has time, doesn't he? Okay, um, John Walsh, on item 45, please come, come forward. Item 45, Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org, or just go to J. Walsh Confidential. This is number 45, Venice Beach Poets Monument Project. We're all in favor of this. A monument to uh, Venice Beach Poets, it's, and it's only $5,000, but we also ask you to put up a monument to Alice Gruppione, the tourist from Italy whose, fa whose father owns a football, uh, uh, a Bologna team, a soccer team, who was m killed, bled to death on our boardwalk. I speak to every Italian on the planet and every tourist. They don't give a damn about the blood of the tourist that was spilled on this street. All they're interested in is nameless poets. The blood is there and it is on your hands. Nothing like this happens in J any other city. John, come back Hollywoodhighlands.org. The monument should stand okay, for her. Okay, th thank you. Okay, uh, no more speakers. Let's prepare to uh, vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Item 44. Uh, Mr. Walsh still has time, correct? One minute from Mr. Walsh. Uh, Mr. Sachs, okay, Mr. Walsh passes. Mr. Sachs, you have time. Uh, Mr. Herman does not uh, call us uh, through as well. Oh, and, and Mr. Sachs has passed. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this item. No speakers on the queue. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the, the vote. Twelve eyes. Okay. Now we're going to move to uh, item 46. And I think I have a George Abrahams. I think that's it, and a Fran uh, Reichenbach. Please come forward. And if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Uh, I was on the uh, tour buses. Uh, I oppose the section in the motion for funding uh, for the tour bus retrofit. Uh, tour bus operators should just be told that any new vans have to comply with the clean air requirement. Uh, they routinely replace them every five years so they don't look ratty, so there would be no actual economic hardship and uh, funding really isn't needed for it. And in general, I oppose the idea that taxpayers should pay for businesses to comply with the law. Uh, the city has been giving away money, has been playing Santa Claus to business for a very long time. It gave $52 million to billionaire Eli Broad for a parking lot. Uh, it spent almost a uh, billion dollars to com complete useless CRA projects. Uh, just last Friday, there was a motion to study a bond measure for retrofitting of old concrete buildings. And the, the, when, I, when I have to comply with the law, 
there's no tax break for me, there's no bond measure, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, the citizens, when we ask for reopening of fire stations, more park rangers, patching our concrete streets, or undergrounding of overhead utilities, we're told there's no money, and that's because the, the city is playing Santa Claus to businesses, and I believe that it needs to stop. Thank you. Hi. Yes. My name is Fran Reichenbach. You did well. <laughs> you pronounced it right. Um, I'm here to speak on uh, Tom LaBonge's motion. Um, and I, oh boy, it'd be great if he was listening. <laughs> He's not, listening. Not you, Tom. He's oh, listening. Go right ahead. Okay. We agree with the studies that the city obviously conducted um, regarding clean fuel that led to the conversion of city vehicles to alternative via fuel vehicles. So, can we first agree that the feasibility study regarding conversion of tour vans and buses is redundant? If you agree, then you will not be voting to spend taxpayer dollars on such a redundant study. The greater issue here is that the greater issue here should cause a no vote is that why would the city even for one minute consider exploring potential funding for the conversion of tour buses and vans? Tour companies are private businesses with a capital B. They should be mandated now to convert to clean fuel or lose their licenses. They make money taking tourists on our streets, streets that are crumbling for lack of funding. We should not spend one dollar supporting private businesses until we have spent one billion dollars fixing our own roadways. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. LeBond. Yeah, thank you very much for the public speakers. Many of the streets in their neighborhood have been repaved. This is just an opportunity uh, in, uh, in our own way for any vehicle that we have to help it convert. I don't know if you know that ad that you see on television with the MTA bus. It's a national ad talking about Los Angeles in a negative way, but then say positive because we have cleaner fuel buses. Uh, a cooperation is uh, necessary. And uh, it's important that we look at this aspect. This will go to committee. I ask for an I vote. Thank you. All right, let's uh, vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, Mr. Lamont. And that will go, uh, it, uh, the, the uh, note, Matt, Mr. Clerk, the previous Department of Environmental Affairs has been consolidated. Uh, into sanitation. Thank you, Mr. Parks, if you note that so it goes to the right department. Thank you, Mr. LeBonge. Okay, Mr. Englander, we do have a few cards. Let me see who has time. I know Mr. Sachs has time. On item 48, Arnold, and Mr. Walsh has time? No? Wait, John does? Okay, so come on, John. You have time. Mr. Herman is out of time. Mr. Kahl is out of time, correct? All right. Uh, Mr. Sachs, go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Um, and this is about the billing fiasco, I take it, with the DWP and uh, rest his soul. But I believe uh, Councilman Zine, when he sat in his chambers, on more than one occasion brought up the fact that his bill was very difficult to read. And that was before this new DWP head and before the other DWP head and probably at least two other Department of Water and Power heads. So why has it taken the city council, even before we had the ratepayer advocate, so long to stay on this subject? If one councilman can have a problem with his bills, what are the other council people doing? Why has it taken three years, minimum, because that's when he was brought this up. He's been out of office now for six months. So three years, minimum, when bills were being discussed for the council to stay on this subject, and all of a sudden to find out that this whole process has pretty much what, doubled in cost, tripled in cost? What has been going on? It's not like the DWP 
is hiding under a rock. It's not like they're not a subject every four or five months in the newspaper. What have you done? Maybe it's the fact that you're spending time on presentations instead of looking at DWP functions, as you should be. It's disgraceful when you have to come up and say, do your job, other councilmen bring it up as a problem, and everybody drops the ball. That's not fair, and it's not right to the constituents. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Point of order, there's a child sitting in Mr. Krikorian's seat. Okay, DWP billing, I'm talking to you. What we have here is the worst case scenario. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people were sent false billing. Now they didn't pay the false billing, and as we speak, their DWP it, water and power is being cut off, and it will be, continue to be cut off until you vote. I, I thought Nichols was going to do a good job. He isn't worth a dime, Mr. Nichols. This scandal, this billing gate, DWP billing gate, is unlike any in the history of this city and probably in this state. And I'm saying to you, don't pay your bill. Check it out. It's a phony. Don't look at your bill. They're admitting it, and they're going to get up here on HollywoodHighlands.org. You are a disgrace with thank your phony you, bills. Thank you, thank you, Okay, now if we could, uh, I think I'll defer to Mr. Uh, Fuentes or Mr. Englander, I would think. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. President, colleagues. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll ask uh, Ron, uh, if you could, DWP to come forward. Um, and let me just open it up by um, first thanking the chairman of the committee, um, Felipe Fuentes, who has uh, really done a great job in terms of a leadership role in making sure that these issues are heard immediately. But this is beyond uh, that, and it's beyond what we've been hearing about. And it is Billing Gate that's happened. Um, we've heard and, and learned of, of nightmare stories of our customers getting not only late notifications and threat notices of them losing your, their utilities. These are families, these are seniors on fixed incomes uh, that are scared to death. Uh, we've heard um, of nightmare stories that we've learned about where people are on auto pay and uh, suddenly their savings is sucked out of their account and they can't pay their bills or they're bouncing checks. Um, we had a situation where there was a woman um, who was on hold for 10 hours and uh, was scared that she was going to, and was crying, she was going to lose her utilities. Um, if you can imagine the horror um, of what's occurring right now, we've, we've got to do something immediately to stop the bleeding. Um, you know, we brought in one thing that I, I brought in a motion uh, recently for auto return of phone calls because we were, we were hurry, hearing and learning of the fact that uh, people were being put on hold for hours at a time. Uh, and I want to thank DWP for implementing that. We heard that motion in last week um, in committee. It was immediately responded to. DWP put that in place on Tuesday. But this has really turned into an iceberg problem. We've learned um, the tip of it at nearing 50 or $60 million in this billing issue. Uh, and, and, uh, and we're hearing now that it's up to uh, at least even $162 million, And we don't know how much longer, how much deeper this is going to go on. So I'm calling for a moratorium to stop the bleeding immediately, um, to stop sending people disconnect notices, to stop draining their accounts. Um, perhaps we can look at an algorithm that if there are irregularities and their bill suddenly jumps up a certain percentage, it's kicked out of the system for a secondary review. Perhaps there's things immediately that we could do proactively so our customers aren't scared um, and we're not draining their accounts. And so I'd like the DWP, if you could, um, to address some of these issues, talk about the problem and what's being done to, to solve it and ensure that, that folks uh, aren't feeling either that threat or taking their, their money out of their accounts automatically. Councilmember, I appreciate uh, the, the question and, and pleased to address it and pleased to be here before you here this morning. Um, there's two basic items that that um, this new system, as we're going through its implementation, has, has created a, 
uh, difficulty with about 5% of our customers. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a large number of customers. That's, you know, 70,000 or so uh, customers out of our, out of our, uh, our total electric, anyway. We're, the actions that we're taking to address, number one, we have already taken on uh, ceasing, at least for the balance of this year, and then we'll reassess the, um, any collection activities and, and any disconnects until so, we work through, the, through this system. It, gets, it is getting better each day as we work down, work down this. The two basic things that we're trying to do that cause this, you know, the, the, the primary issue that's causing the, uh, those bills to be higher in some cases than they, than they should be is our, our estimated bills. All utilities estimate bills when they can't read a meter. That happens throughout the world. We've had estimated bills in the past. We have a higher number of them because of a changeover. Anytime we had a changeover in the meters during the time that we're putting this new system in, we didn't have a backlog of, of, the, of historical data for that meter, and that is roughly about 5% of our customers. And the estimation technique that we're using for that, we're, we're, we're working on that to, to make that be more accurate than it's been. Each time we fix one of those on a bill, it's fixed. And then, the, and then that estimation problem will go away. So it's something that literally gets better with every single day of billing that, that we do. The other issue is because of the fact that th there are those, those concerns, the duration of calls gets, gets longer, and that's why our customers are seeing this longer and, and admittedly unacceptable wait time. We, are, we have put the, what we call the virtual hold uh, on that, so if you come on after five, after five minutes, you're given an option to get a call back. We've invoked that. That's helping. We're, putting, uh, we're doing more uh, cross-training of our customer service representatives to get more people on the phones as well and we're working through these estimation issues. So I anticipate we're gonna see continued reduction in those call volumes and continued reduction in those call times. And for those circumstances where we've had somebody who's on an auto pay, uh, which is what you're referring to when someone automatically comes out of their account because they've elected to do that, we, we are uh, right now writing, when that comes, we're instantly sending out a check out to them and we're looking at the po prospect of being able to do that electronically as well. Okay, with that, um, and, and again, this is, and it, and, it, and it sounds like there may be some hope. Um, I'm just not convinced. And, um, and the, the issue that this is, you know, while it's only 5% of customers, 70,000 households are, are approximately affected. That's a huge number. Um, if it were one or two, that's a huge number. If somebody um, lost their life savings, or their checking account was instantly um, pillaged and they couldn't pay their, their bill, um, their other bills, and, uh, or they had a fear of losing their electricity, that's a big deal. Uh, the fact that there are 70,000. So what can we do in terms of some kind of immediate moratorium and looking at and ensuring these people aren't gonna get these um, threat notices, if you will, uh, and there's some comfort knowing that the problem will be fixed before their utilities are shut off or before they get a threat notice or before their accounts are drained. We, we, we have done that. We, we, we've invoked that this week, that we've stopped, we've stopped collections and we've stopped disconnect notices uh, on, on this matter until, until this gets sorted and through. And the same thing on auto pay? Correct. So we're not taking any additional money out of auto pay, so people could be assured that if, if their bill is more than it should have been, it's not going to come directly out of their account? Uh, well, there be, could be some that have, that, have gone, that have gone through ar already, but we're, we'll, we'll work through that backlog on that, and we're working with, them, uh, working with them quickly on those issues, and we're reducing the call time so that if those issues come up, they'll be able to get And then how get did to we it. get to $162 million, as we've learned in the press, that this problem has started at $50 million, and now we're looking at at well, least $162 million? If well, there actually, there's a, I think there's been a misunderstanding with regard to that. The, the $50 million, Really more like $59 million is the what we call the system integration contract. There's, let me just back up for a second, there's kind of three buckets of costs related to this whole process, okay? One is our software and, uh, software and hardware, which is uh, about $29 million. 
we've got outside services then to use that software and hardware that's about $70 million uh, on, on top of that. So there's about $100 million. That's, that's information that we have presented numerous times before our board and I believe to, the, to, to council in the past as well. And then there's about $63 million of our labor costs, which frankly, you know, that's a labor cost that we would have had anyway. That's labor that we have. That they would have been doing something else. They would have been though. doing something else in, 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 in any event. So the total of that all comes together at about 162, 60, 163 million dollars. That's that's not that's so. It's, it's I, I got to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm not I'm not comforted in hearing uh, a lot of the uh, and uh, excuses. Quite frankly, where we're at, and and we're really looking for solutions here immediately. Um, but I want to turn it over to some of my colleagues to answer well, thank you, ask and ask some, some, some other questions. Time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Fuente. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Englander, for bringing this motion forward. In committee, we had a very good conversation and we were joined by Mr. Kikorian, which I think helped us understand sort of the gravity of the, of the problem. And so I'm hoping that at some point, Mr. Nichols, that you can help us understand sort of uh, the problem in greater detail. You, you mentioned that 5% of the rate base, about 70,000 households are affected. In committee, we learned that there were these uh, protocols that were established for each of those problems. And so they range from uh, probably not very severe to some of the stuff that we've read about in the, in the paper. Rule one being uh, the measure where uh, if there wasn't a way to read the meter, we would default to the previous uh, year's billing cycle. Rule two being uh, the one where we defaulted to the previous month's billing cycle. And then rule three seeming to be sort of the more uh, troublesome rule default where we would just take a real big estimation uh, giving sort of the region surrounding the service there. Of the 5%, I have to imagine that there's a capability of running analytics to understand how many are in rule one, how many are in rule two, and how many are in rule three. One and two is probably not, I'm going to guess, driving a lot of the call volume and concern because the estimations are at least in the ballpark, let's say. But rule three seems to be where we're reading about folks who are paying th 30 times uh, some uh, exaggerated amount of, of usual billing. How big of a, a, a problem do we have? We know it's 5% of the rate base, but where are we getting the, the, the bulk of our calls is, is sort of my, my first question. And then the second question really comes to sort of the implementation of this change. I, as Mr. Krikorian mentioned in committee, couldn't agree more that it was time to update this system. But in the rollout, I think we're beginning to recognize that for uh, the contract, there wasn't sort of uh, the preparation, I think, to be able to let our constituents know what it is that was going to happen. Um, and I'm just wondering if there wasn't any uh, consideration done by the board or uh, the department to try to figure out how to mitigate some of these things. One of the ideas that I had, unfortunately, after committee ended was wondering why we didn't ramp up uh, and outsource some of the calling center functions to be able to sort of mitigate the impact that we had. I think the ability to have a visual, uh, uh, virtual callback is very important, but understanding that the ramp up might have some challenges, did we at all consider uh, or the consultants consider uh, outsourcing some of the call center functions. Uh, was there any um, other sort of protocols that were uh, advised to, to the board and, and, and what did we not sort of uh, explore as, as opportunities? Um, and then lastly, if you could help me understand what we can tell customers, because fortunately there's a lot of press attention involving this particular issue that DWP is facing. We heard in committee that the ability to take a photo with your camera, digital phone, uh, of the meter and calling in that information once we were able to get through might help us sort of write the information, give the department the experience needed to, to fix the problem quickly. What can customers do today? Spend some real time on, on those three parts for me, if you would, please. Okay, let me start on some of this and I'll turn some over to uh, Sharon Grove, who's our head of customer service. In terms of the I'll speak to the outsourcing and the other protocols and the preparation that we did going up to this. Um, this has been an effort that's been three years in the making. Um, it's probably a good 10 months longer than, than we had, had anticipated. And the reason in part that it's taken that, that much time is taking a system that's you know, 39 years old, 
keeping the existing system going, which, which was unable to do many of the things that, that this new system will do once, once it's running smoothly. Uh, that old system could not deal with solar bills. It, we had to do those by hand. You'll recall that, that, any, that oftentimes, I rem recall being back before this council about two years ago when we had difficulties with delayed bills and errors in bills from our old existing system and we spent a lot of time working through that recognizing that every single one of those fixes had to be done by hand uh, at, at that point. Nothing in this uh, old system would allow us to deal with uh, what we, some of the things we're doing with our energy efficiency programs uh, and as we ramp up in greater solar we would have to do all of that, all of that by hand. So at the end of the day we also had a circumstance where that system as a 40-year-old system, finding individuals who even know how to fix it when it breaks has been a, a, a tremendous problem for us. So there was no choice but to move forward. Utilities across the nation are doing this. We're doing it later than, than, many, than many did. We had did a number of, dr of dress rehearsals through this, uh, three full dress rehearsals on testing this out, which is one of the reasons we delayed, delayed that, fixed some of the issues that we learned through all of that. There comes a point in time when you, you simply have to go live with it to, to know in a real working environment exactly how the system works. And we, we did make both our board and, and our customers aware that we were invoking this new system. There could be some issues with it. You know, perhaps, uh, perhaps we might have been a little bit more, uh, a, a little bit more vocal about, about that. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, in terms of, of effort of outsourcing, we spoke with our with our system integration consultants uh, on on this, and their view and ours was that you had to know the old system, you had to know the new, know the new system, and the prospects of actually getting an outsourced person to come in and learn both of those systems and be, <clears throat> be available to deal with it really wasn't going to help, and it might actually exacerbate the problem. So um, on, on that <laughs> point, let me just say that my my thinking is that if nothing else, the warm handoff to be able to have folks who uh, maybe we have an outsourced call center in place, and then you have folks who are documenting, you know, Felipe Fuentes is called, he seems to have, you know, a rule one, rule two, rule three problem, at least so that there is some certainty on the uh, residents and that we're actually making it to the department versus some of the stories that we've heard. It wasn't, you know, my suggestion right. isn't to sort of solve and have them input the information and right. draw mm -hmm. the estimate bill, et cetera, et cetera. It's just right. how there, there had to have been some more ideas as to how to sort of deal with the mitigating problems, uh, the mitigation of problems that would have happened. Well, the, dif the difficulty with, with that is if you have someone who doesn't know the system and taking a customer call, they can be, you know, there can be a warm voice on, on, on the end of that, but if they can't fix the customer's problem, then that customer's going to end up having to call back again or have us call back, and, and, and I, know it's, I know it's incredibly frustrating for people who are sitting on uh, for, for very long periods of time. We are working on that. I think we're making good progress on, on that through, and, and the, the very items that, that Council Member Englander has, has requested here with respect to stopping the, uh, the collections and, and disconnect notices that are going out will, will significantly reduce that call volume. It'll allow us to deal with, with those uh, more expeditiously, and I expect we'll see a significant turnaround on this. Mr. Frentes, thank you. If you want to add more, you can well, well, no, it's just that push we, we, your button. there were two, two, right. two elements right. that were left out. Sort of, right. you got rule right. one, two, and three. Right. We know 5% of the rate base is being affected. How much of it is sort of a serious problem? And then the last part was uh, trying to understand um, what customers can do right now to figure out how to address their problems. Thank Mr. you, President. Mr. Frentes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Again, this is Sharon Grove. I run the Customer Service Division. and. Thank you very much for those suggestions. I do have to run the analytics to see what percent of that 5% were affected by the trend, which is the rule number three estimate. And those were the ones that we were having problems with. That's correct. And so I will work those analytics and make sure that I circle back with that information. Um, I, I do, we did, you know, to, to Ron's, to Ron's um, comments, we, we did plan and have added uh, representatives, but we underestimated how many representatives we would need. So um, that's something that we have now um, taken action on. 
to increase our resources to be able to answer customers' calls because you're right, we need to, to have them trained, but we also need to answer the phone. So I understand and acknowledge that. For what customers can do, uh, we, we again thank them very much for their patience. Uh, it's unacceptable. We're correcting it. We can have them, we have, we have also ramped up what we call our e-team, so customers can email us at ccenter at ladwp.com and we're responding to those emails very quickly with their questions, either a call back or to do a bill correction for them. They can still call the 1-800-DAL-DWP. Again, we're putting in that um, virtual hold for customers and we're, we're adding additional resources. So I, I do again thank customers for their understanding and we acknowledge that uh, we, need, we have some work to do. Thank you. Mr. Krikorian. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think Mr. Fuentes Thorough questioning has covered most of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I appreciate your both being here. I think it's very important that Mr. Englander brought this uh, matter before us, and Mr. Fuentes chaired a very thorough meeting of the Energy and the Environment Committee when uh, his motion and mine and Mr. Englander's and Mr. Bonin's and a number of others uh, who have brought concern about this were considered and, and I believe taken very seriously by the department. And so. Uh, let me just say I appreciate the, the quick response and the thoroughness of the response to our requests for reports back. We will be coming back in, I believe, 60 days, Mr. Fuentes, back to the Energy and the Environment Committee with a follow-on report uh, regarding the progress that the Department is making and all the things that the Council uh, has, has requested. Um, I think it's also important that, and I assume this will be done, that there will be an internal analysis uh, of lessons learned from this process so that um, you can report back to the council on what we should have done and what the department should have done and could do better. Uh, clearly this was a situation where this system had to change, but clearly I think the department would be uh, the first to acknowledge that it didn't go as well as hoped. And the system should have been online in November. It wasn't. We had plenty of advance notice to let our constituents know about this. Uh, and I feel that the, the one thing that really was not done very well was preparing the public uh, with the understanding that this was going to happen, that there might be wildly varying estimated bills, that it would work out. I don't think the public was well aware of that. That, that was problem number one. Problem number two is when these wildly varying bills did come out, there was no adequate way to get an immediate response. And I experienced that myself, calling about my own bill uh, and was on hold for 45 minutes, couldn't reach a human being to be able to resolve what was clearly incorrect. Um, and so I, I very much, I think we all understand the extraordinary frustration that the public is feeling about this. Um, and uh, what I'd like to ask, and just my closing seconds is you, you touched upon a number of the benefits of the new system, uh, Mr. Nichols. If you can talk about why this had to be done, first of all, and if you have some thoughts about lessons learned, what we can do to do a better job about public outreach in advance, um, and what we can do to be better prepared to ensure that the kind of horror stories that Mr. Englander talked about and the automatic billing, I think, was one that I hadn't even considered, but this is a horrible situation when someone has already signed up for automatic billing and the money just goes out without even a, any human intervention and it's ten times what it could have been, how can we do a better job of preventing those things from happening in the first place instead of responding to them after the fact, which I, I think the department is committed to doing and I appreciate that, but these are the kinds of situations where we really need to have a situation where we don't have the problem occur in the first place. So if you could speak to those points, please. Oh, and, and I'm sorry, since I'm out of time. One other thing I'd like to add is that as we move forward in Mr. Englander's motion, and I'm hoping that there will be unanimous support for his, his motion, um, the, the one thing I would like to uh, point out, and I, I think it's consistent with what Mr. Englander wants to achieve, is that there are outstanding bills that are clearly unrelated to any contested uh, estimates or anything else, simply people who are not paying their bills. Um, there is going to be human intervention in this process by DWP management to distinguish between the bills that are actually contested and those that are simply not being paid. 
um, and Mr. Engler, I, I think that this, I hope that this is consistent with what you want to achieve. I'd like to make sure that it, at least after that human intervention takes place, we're not putting a moratorium on those who are simply choosing not to pay their bills because that wouldn't be fair to ratepayers who are paying their bills. So if, I, I think that's, that's consistent with the language, but I just wanted to make that clarification. So. Well, that, that is consistent with, with, with our, with, with, the, with the change practice that we're proposing. That's how we interpret it. I think that is appropriate. If someone has a pattern of, of simply not paying their bills for reasons unassociated with this change and has had that pattern prior to this changeover, it would be, I think it would be unfair to our other customers to have them shoulder um, us not seeking to get proper collection of those past bills, but we want to make sure that people know that if there is an error with respect to uh, to this bill estimation process that, that uh, we work through on here, that they are not going to be encountering uh, charges on, on that and they are not going to be facing disconnection, um, uh, disconnect uh, by, by the department as a result of, of this system change. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gregorian. Any uh, extra push your uh, but Mr. Parks. Thank you. One thing I was wondering, could you just kind of give a quick overview again of when Mr. England you talked about accounts being rated? What does that incorporate? So someone is signed up for a automatic pay and no matter what the bill is, they just take it out of the account? Is that what we're talking Th about? That's how auto pay functions work, whether okay. whether you're a utility or you do it for your credit card bill or your insurance bill, et cetera, the way an auto pay works is, is that you're set up for that and it's a direct, it's a direct pay out of your account. The, the unfortunate circumstance, and we're working to correct this, okay. is, uh, is a small number of our, of our customers who have, have received these, uh, these estimations from the new, from the new system um, that are higher than what appears it should be comes to them and comes out of and comes out of their account. We are addressing those. We're we are presently trying same day upon learning that getting a check out to them. It might take you know the, the mail to get that to them. And we're investigating the opportunity whether we actually can electronically make a reversal in, in their in their bank account. We actually have to work through that that process. Let me ask you, where are we on the digital meters? Is would that have helped this situation or have well, we made any progress on that? We, we have made progress on that. Actually, there's probably one of the issues that, that has occurred here is that any time during, during this period that we were making this transit, transition from the old system to the new, uh, any meter change that we, that we made uh, had, had an issue of not having the historic data from that old meter in the system. So when we did an estimate, we weren't able to go back and estimate based on that actual prior meters information. So when, so any, any sort of estimate, any meter change that we made has been one of the primary sources of, of, the, uh, of, of these estimations and, and the additional calls that we're getting on that. You, are you saying that those are the primary, the digital meters that we're piloting were the ones well, that... Any, oh, not so just any meter any change. Meter. If we have a new customer, you know, okay. the, the customer is left, moved out of a residence, and a new customer comes in, we do a meter change. If, if many of our meters were constantly replacing because they're old, um, you, any meter change whatsoever that we made has, the, has this issue. And, and it's, and it's a, cumulatively, there are probably about somewhere I would say five to 7,000 meters that are the, the new uh, digital meters that we, have, that we have been installed that are a part of that issue. Okay. And but not, not simply because they're a digital meter. It wouldn't okay. matter what type of meter it was. It's the history. It's yeah. just that information yeah. Mr. history. Mr. Corey had covered a couple of my concerns as to it appeared by the word moratorium that we're ceasing, but it appears from your interpretation, those legitimate bills that we verify we're still collecting as opposed to that we're moratorium on all uh, elimination of service because of this motion. For those circumstances where we have had, already have in process, uh, working with a customer for past collections where, where they hadn't been paying prior to this, we're still going to work through those prior customers going forward in, the, in this period until we, until we clean, clean up the residual of this, we are not planning on doing collections going, going forward for 
new issues that come up. We anticipate this will be a relatively short period of time. Okay. Uh, colleagues, I just like, and I think this is a report that Mr. Nichols sent us uh, back in 2011. Right. Right. Just to keep in perspective what volume, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of your reports reflect that you deal with 50,000 bills per day, about 12 million a year. And before this system went in play, you had about, about one-fourth of one percent actually were in delay. I don't know the exact numbers, but we had significant delayed bill problems in the old system because of the manual touches that were necessary to render bills. Okay. So I can't I'll really... Just, I'll just share this report okay. that uh, you sent us on April 26, 2011. You said only about one-fourth of one percent of our customers expen uh, experience multiple periods of delay on their billing. And you went on to state that uh, the 12 million per year billing uh, for the city, 50,000 per day. And then it went on to uh, quote that there was significant reduction in delayed billing uh, as it relates to, uh, for water, it dropped down from 3,500 to 1,900, and for electric from 4,200 to 1,800. So we're just quoting back your report so I'm assuming that we jumped to 5% from the one quarter of 1% is because of the new system as it relates to the error factor. Is that what we can assume? Well, we're dealing with, we're dealing dealing with two, two different, different things. One, okay. one of those is delayed, delayed billing. Okay. The prior issue was with respect to delayed bills, mm -hmm. and you would get a situation where, where bills would go up over multiple periods of time and someone did not receive a bill. That was uh, those, what, what those numbers were referring to. Okay. Um, and we did work manually, intervened on that to get that, get that number down from about 3,900 to, I want to say it was about, I don't remember exactly, about 1,500 about 1, at that time. That's just multiple periods where, where we had the information or didn't have the information, ultimately got it, then someone got multiple bill cycles all in one bill, and, and, and we're quite surprised by that. We have, through manual intervention in our old system, drove that down significantly. Okay. What we're talking about here is a circumstance where we're estimating a significantly higher number of bills. Previously, about, I would say somewhere on the order of 1% of our bills Chief, you may were want to estimated press your bills again. before, and that number now is five plus percent. But can I just make one comment? Oh, and yeah. I want to push my button again. Ready to wrap it up. I, I would just ask you two things. that We certainly got to fix where people's checking accounts have been bled, and we have to fix the 10-hour delay on customer service. But I asked Mr. Englander, hopefully the wording is so specific on this, it talks about moratorium. If there's some way that we could give them the discretion of dealing with these on a case-by-case, -case, and this relates to saying they're all, we don't collect money, because I'm concerned about the impact on the, their collecting revenue, which affects our general fund down the road, which is our transfer that we leave money on the table that we need not to. So that would be my only suggestion. Okay, so I'll go to Mitch to let you respond, and then I'll go back to the other speakers on the, the queue. So Mr. Englander. Thank you. It's a good point, and Mr. Corrine brought that up as well. And the intent and uh, in talking to the DWP is um, they're going to look at it. Um, it will be a moratorium on any and all uh, late notices and notices of disconnect um, in terms of irregularities, uh, the ones that they're going to double check and look at and triple check are those ones that aren't paying their bills to ensure that those continue. So that is the spirit of this as well. Thank you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank uh, you, Mr. Fuentes, for your leadership uh, as, as the committee chair and you, Mr. Englander, for your um, push for the moratorium on the disconnect, especially in the holiday season when people are preparing their holiday meals. It's never been a more important time to, to get that straightened out. I have a letter, one of many letters that I've received. This one's from a Silver Lake constituent who owed $40 and has been charged $1,766 twice and unenrolled from auto pay, but then was kicked back into auto pay. But I understand that um, case management is, is helping with that, so I appreciate that. And, and I am encouraged uh, by your response, Ms. Grove, and I appreciate that, and Mr. Nichols. Um, I have a, a question just for clarification for my own purposes uh, in relation to the system change costs. What's that middle one, the $70 million one? I have $29 million for software and hardware. I have $63 million for our labor costs, but what was that middle one? The, the middle one is for the system integrator, which is the company that you, you buy the software and it's a standard set of software. And I guess it's important to note that this isn't just our, our 
our customer information system isn't just our meters and billing. It's everything we do with field work dispatching. It's all of our meter reading, our, our, our route setting, mm -hmm. our outage management, the building systems itself, the account management, the custom collection, customer collections, credit issues, mm -hmm. our website changes. There's ev almost every business process that the department has touches this system. Some 25 different systems are touched electronically. So you buy a piece of soft software, mm -hmm. uh, Oracle software, which is an industry standard. Uh, there are really only two industry standards out there. And then you retain a, a company that comes in and manages all those interconnections to say, how does your 40-year-old system, how do we change all that functionality and make it work with this standard software so it works for the specific conditions at the Department of Water and Power? And then we had a separate entity that worked with us to help us both anticipate what those some 2,000 functional changes that had to be had to be addressed, and to and, and to work with us on that. The combination of those two companies was about 70, 70 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. And with respect to what Mr. Park said about 50,000 bills a day that come through the system, and I know you have your work cut out for you with 70,000 customers. Um, who have, of uh, the 5% who have been disadvantaged by this. Um, I just want to close with something kind of positive, and that is in my years of public service, I have found LADWP to be very flexible in, in terms of um, the bills that were shut off due to lack of pay, lack, mm -hmm. lack of funds during the holiday season. Uh, and, I, and I urge uh, the department to continue working with constituents when they face that difficulty and they can't prepare their Thanksgiving or Christmas meal and, and work out uh, a payment system um, based on the particular need of the household. So uh, I, I urge you to continue working with us so we can uh, continue helping uh, our constituents who have a certain time of need in their lives. So thank you. And, and, and we will indeed, and we will report back, make sure the council is aware of both through, mm -hmm. through committee and then back to make sure you're aware of our progress as we work through that. Thanks. Mr. Labange. Problem with our bills, because you carry our bills, right? Correct. And 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 you rotate it around the city at like fifty thousand a day, etc. You have any problem with our bills? We don't have any significant problems. We have good relationships with the city departments, and we're able to get at the table. And they're very complex billing at times, and we're able to sit down. So we have good contacts right. at all the different departments. And how many? Uh, Eight hundred thousand customers. Is that how we go uh, by? We have one point four million customers. By meter. And we have 2.2 million meters. 2.2 million meters. The combination meters. of electric and water meters, we have 2.2 million 2 meters. 2.2 million meters. And of that, how many are, uh, how many are in the, that you shut off, that you have to because they're a failure to pay? Just uh, would you say on an average week, if you would? It, it does vary. We've been very careful since we've gone live, and, and as the councilmen have noted, we've, it's a, been a very manual process since go live. Right. But uh, usual on our customer base, we have at any one time um, approximately 100,000 customers that are in arrears. Those aren't customers that are anywhere near being shut off, but we do work with a lot of our uh, customers. How many are commercial customers and how many are residential? The vast majority are residential Residential customers. on that issue here. And then also, in, prior to both your time, the Department of Water Power had tremendous field offices in communities throughout Los Angeles. Over time, you've closed them down. There used to be a beautiful one on uh, Coinga Boulevard, right south of Yucca and Lincoln Heights, right north, uh, I think, uh, not on Griffith Avenue, but on Daly, I think it is. And, but how many field offices do you have? We have 14 customer service centers around the city. Right. And we have four basic uh, regional field offices for meter reading and field services that have satellite offices as well at the customer service Yeah, center. just reach out to our neighborhood. You do a good job on that neighborhood council. But just reach out to them and just see what it is. Not everybody goes online, and a lot of people like to walk in and see you face-to-face because -face. they see you face-to-face, -face, they think they're really working for you. When you pay your bill at uh, the John Ferraro building, you got to pay for parking? I, I think we have a 20. You can go into the customer service lot, and we'll give you 20 minutes. 20 you can get minutes your things to go right. in and out. Right. So this is good. Uh, anything, any new system is complicated, right. but it's no fun when it's not right. We could take that from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which we all know is the right thing to get health care for people. But at the same time, 
the Department of Water Power that serves us every day. How many outages do you have a day, Ron? Well, it, 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 vary, it varies by season. But by season, but, right. But we can have, we can have, you know, one or two, or, right. uh, or we, can have, water, we can have, you know, water in, terms, in terms of outages, of the, we can have several yeah. thousand people out with a single outage. If there's a storm on that. Right. And then you've got to trace it back. You've got to trace it back. You can't just look right. at a big board and say That's the right. power's out in 90026. You've got to actually go to the pole and say it's out here, it's on there, and feed it back, which is interesting. Has ever there not been any water for the people of Los Angeles? I'm sorry, say again? Has ever there not been any water for the people no, we, of Los Angeles? We've always had, we've always had water with people of Los Angeles. A Mulholland question right, right over the plate. Continue to do your uh, good work, but this is important because we should never lose faith in the public utility that serves us the best, and that's what you try to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kerkorian. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Obanja's question and the reference to 20-minute validation reminded me uh, that about the service centers, that one of the complaints I've frequently gotten since the rollout has been long lines uh, and long wait times at the service centers uh, with uh, in what appeared to my constituents to be inadequate staffing. Uh, to service all the people who were there to either pay or get more information about their bill. And 20 minutes validation would not have been enough validation for some of those people. So I guess uh, my question is we talked a little bit about how we're fixing some of the wait time on calls, but has staffing increased since the rollout at the service center? Are you increasing the amount of overtime uh, with current uh, staff members or bringing new staff members on so that we can help expedite service at the service centers. That's right. We have increased staff at the customer service centers. We've actually employed uh, other, we've, we've had other employees come and work the lines in the customer service centers just to offer to take payments and write receipts right in line so people can just leave Excellent. from there. Okay. And so we're working through that. We're trying to be flexible. We understand that our customers um, are being very patient with us and we do appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Englander. Hopefully to close. Hopefully. Okay. Yes. Um, then I, I uh, colleagues ask um, that we send this forthwith. I ask for your I vote uh, that this go immediately to the board of commissioners, the PWP, um, and that they implement all of these suggestions as well, um, and send a message to our customers, uh, if we could, that um, they should not be in fear. Um, that we've already gotten results back from the virtual hold system that's cut the time in half. Uh, since it was implemented just a couple days ago. Uh, but more importantly, that if they do have an issue, they can also call us directly, call your council member. Uh, we're there for you. And I know a lot of people will continue to, um, you know, as they're opening their mail while this just was implemented uh, as a moratorium, they're still going to receive some of these because the mail already went out. Um, and uh, that, uh, that the DWP is, is taking this very seriously as, 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 as we are. And, and we remain outraged about it, uh, as well as Mr. Nichols is what he indicated as well. So thank you for that. And good work by you and Mr. Uh, Fuentes. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this issue. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay. And Mr. President, pardon me, there's been a request uh, given the uh, Thanksgiving holiday to send all matters uh, today forthwith. Okay, then that'll be the order. What is uh, before us now? Mr. President, that takes counsel to uh, general public comment for uh, matters not on council's agenda. Okay, Mr. Labange. John Walsh. Sean Murphy, Phyllis Doherty, please. I want to wish everybody a happy, all my fans out in the, here in LA, a happy Thanksgiving and worldwide. I uh, hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving. I'll be singing in the choir in the morning. Uh, the St. Charles Via Furbishing is going well. I want to let KCAL 9 know it's moving right along, no stallments yet. Should be open by Easter. Uh, that's all. I gotta go. I'm in a hurry because I gotta go to my hair appointment. Thank you. John Walsh, blogging at Hollywood 
highlands.org or J. Walsh Confidential. Uh, Herb Wesson, he was gone for three weeks, absent without leave, doesn't tell us where he is, who knows. Yesterday was another suicide on the red line, 10 times the suicide rate per station of, of, of uh, the subway in New York. That's on my website. But the most important thing is Glenn Dakegate. Now, if the mayor wants to have a boyfriend, he has a right to a boyfriend. If his wife doesn't mind, they have a right. That's called a menage a trois. But incidentally, his picture is on my website, hollywoodhighlands.org. The whole series of incidents, he goes back to 13 years with the mayor. Okay, now, and you can see, you know, if, if I wanted to go gay, this is the guy I'd be with, Glenn Dake. Take a look at him. Boy, he's a 10 plus. Okay, now, and uh, look at him with his Play Dirty t-shirt on there. But the point is that Glenn Dake's sister was appointed to the Planning Commission with absolutely no qualifications because of what? Some pillow talk between Garcetti and Glenn Dake? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Villaraigosa did the same thing. I'm telling you right now, it's all up there. If Glenn Dake or the mayor want to sue me for slander, come right be my guest, because the minute they sue me, I can put them on the stand. I have discovery, and I'll find out the whole thing. And I want you to know there is no malice here. I just want everyone to know, and they all know here, except you don't know out there, Glenn Dake, D-A-K-E, he's the mayor's boyfriend. They suck one another off. Oh, uh, hey, uh, all right, Mr. City Clerk, strike that from the record. I did anyway. Phyllis Doherty, for those, this is public comment where anybody can say anything they want as witnessed by our last speaker. Thank you. Phyllis Doherty with the Animal Issues Movement. Um, I am here. I brought you copies of my article. It is up today on the fact that the San Diego Pet Shop has sued not only the city, but also the large animal activist groups and their attorneys for passing a ban on puppy sales in that city. And the same thing undoubtedly is going to happen here. I hope Mr. Krikorian can, uh, can hear this because this is a federal case. What has happened is that people have forgotten that, that interstate commerce, which is the puppy mill issue, is regulated solely by the federal government. This man will win this lawsuit, and he will be, uh, receive his damages. And the same thing will happen in the city of Los Angeles because there is no nexus between puppy mills and pet, and pet shops and animal shelters. And you cannot just say that it will make a difference in animal shelters because you, because you ban pet shops. Just because you take all of the Maserati dealers out of the city does not mean that people will buy more Kias. And if people want a Yorkshire puppy or a Golden Retriever puppy, they are not going to take a pit bull out of the shelter. So there is no nexus. He will win this case. But the problem is that we have an additional issue, which is that the PAW Committee has also approved, it plan, probably is planned to go on consent to also bypass the CUP process in this city and place dog kennels in shopping malls next to restaurants, daycare centers, by allowing only rescue organizations to bypass the CU process, CUP process, make giving a special group a special privilege that will not be available to any other person or business entity in this city. That is coming up on December 3rd. It's 11-1754-S1. I would highly recommend that you delay that until the results of this federal lawsuit. Richard Robinson. Mr. President, members, Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. The Fred Jordan Mission will close several blocks with the city's help of Fifth Street at Town near San Pedro. The mission will be serving turkey and dressing to thousands with all the fixings all day beginning about noon. 
There will be shoes given away, haircuts, warm clothing, happy Thanksgiving. Also, the city's winter shelters and the counties will be providing emergency services beginning Sunday, the 1st of December. Thank you. Arnold Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Arnold Sachs. It seems that not only in city council, but also in other government agencies, especially the MTA and the Board of Supervisors, more people are running afoul of being out of order on this side of the microphone than getting answers from, quest for, from questions that are asked by people on this side of the microphone, by members of the elected officials. The MTA has taken upon themselves to eliminate a practice that's been in effect for over 16 years. They have a non-consent calendar, which means, and they have a consent calendar also, but on non-consent items, you have the opportunity to supposedly for the 16 years to put a card in and comment on that for one minute. Now the people who sit on the MTA board can't make a meeting on time, yet they find that three minutes is now perfect timing for the public to ask questions on a consent on a non-consent calendar that can have 15 or 20 items. I urge you to call and talk to your representatives on the MTA and the city councils and say this is not fair. The MTA board is going to be looking at asking for a rate increase and also another half cent sales tax within the next three or four years. Yet they haven't addressed the shortage that was proposed for Measure R. Measure R was to do raise $1.3 billion a year in sales tax revenue. It barely registers 800000 They don't want to address that, but they want more money, and they want to cut public comment Mr. on Tassunian. it. Mr. Tassunian. Morning, Mr. President. Gerard Tassunian with the Hollywood City District Neighborhood Council for the identification purposes only. Last week, uh, myself and another fellow board member went to Dodger Stadium and received turkeys for the needy. So I want to thank Councilman Sadio, my Councilman Mitchell Farrell. I believe there were other uh, council representatives uh, passing out turkeys for needy families in their own districts. Tomorrow being Thanksgiving, I want to wish everyone happy Thanksgiving. And I want to go ahead and say thank you for uh, participating and helping out the uh, constituents in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Juan Acala. Um, I printed a little card. Uh, Happy Holidays Humanity from the Dollhouse Dude. United World of Free and Clear. Well, that's what the world should look like. It should be a united world where everybody has a place to live. And no city attorneys, and no city clerks, and no red tape. We don't need any red tape. You are drowning humanity in red tape. Read my book, in my book, I say we are smart enough to cut through all the red tape. Look at Mr. Nichols, who's not even worth a dime, explaining to the people why they're getting their utilities cut off due to error in their favor. And you think the WP needs money? 
They loaned the city a billion dollars a couple of years ago. The city was going broke. The WP had over a billion dollars and the city made them uh, fork it over. Excuse me, the WP doesn't need any more money and they're overcharging the customers. And then he's talking about the people that don't want to pay the utilities. What kind of bullshit world do we live in where you're willing to kill a little old lady because she didn't pay her water or her electricity? You stupid assholes. Before I call the next speaker, I'd like to welcome uh, our students from USC and B Brigham Young University. If you rise, and also special salute to Lawrence William, who's a senior management analyst with the contract administration. Students, welcome. And Brian, thank you for the good job you do. Welcome to City Hall. Good luck in your studies. This is public comment. Brian Barajas, is Brian here? Okay. Now uh, I have a interesting, if they, um, song. Now in the Star Spangled Banner, there's actually four verses. This one goes, the last verse that is. Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the world's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land praise the power there that made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. In the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free. The point here is we're going to make Glass-Steagall the number one issue of the United States and the world. Two, impeachment of this president. Three, asteroid defense. And the revival of John F. Kennedy's legacy. We are free men. We have a constitution. And the killing has to stop. Mr. Herman. Glass Siegel, HR 129, S985, S1282, provide for the more safer and more and more effective use of assets of banks, require control, prevent undue diversions of funds into, into speculative and other purpose violation of our rights. It's unconstitutional when you violate my rights, Mr. City Attorney, by interfering in my public comments. When you interrupt me by interrupting me, again, you're racist, biased against what? Me? A public speaker in a public forum? Ridiculous. Yes, very ridiculous. And then again, we talk about the mayor placing an unqualified commissioner for the purpose of what? What did the Brady Bunch have? Three? Three B-boys got city. How does the Brady Bunch song go? Oh, Brady Bunch, Brady Bunch, I don't know. But three some Brady Bunch, I don't know. But this is my conclusion. Special guest. Please direct your comments. I can't He's hear. He's not making any comments. You have to speak appropriately. 
Uh, That's Zuma Dog, special guest, talking about how you misuse the public funds, how you waste public funds, how you don't allow the public speaker to speak with all your interruptions. And yes, I'm going to file in 10 days against this city for a violation of my rights. And second of all, because you discriminate against me for having a disability. You think it's funny, huh, Mr. Sindri? I don't. I got 10 days, and for the record. Complete public comment there. Uh, bad public comment is allowed, but it must be directed towards the city. Correct, Mr. City Attorney? It has to be within the jurisdiction of the city. The subject matter has to be subject within the matter. jurisdiction. Very well. That is uh, what's before us, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, Council has motions for posting and referral. So ordered. The desk is clear. Any announcements, members? Want to announce uh, Thanksgiving, a wonderful holiday, and also Hanukkah coming all at the same time, first time in many hundreds of years. Also encourage everyone to go out and visit a museum of their choice throughout the Southland, whether it's at Exposition Park, Griffith Park, or the Miracle Mile, or anywhere else. Any adjourning motions? One adjourning motions. All rise for adjourning motions. Mr. Parks. I'd ask uh, Tori Bailey, the granddaughter, Barbara Bailey Wilson, niece, and a family friend, uh, Mr. Edmonds, and also Maria Curtis. Uh, we have a unique situation that we're going to merge two adjourning motions because a husband and wife of 70 years passed away within a year of each other, and so we're going to do them together. I'd like to request the council adjourn in memory of Mary Louise Bailey and James Marvin Bailey, Sr. Mary was born September 28, 1919 in Jefferson City, Missouri. Passed away November 2013. James was born May 5, 1915 in Trenton, Tennessee and passed away August 10, 2012. Mary and James uh, married on October uh, 30, 1938 in Marshall, Missouri. They celebrated their 73rd, uh, 73 wonderful years of marriage. Born to that union was Dr. James Bailey, Jr. and Judge Dwayne Bailey. Mary was a graduate of Lincoln University Laboratory High School in Jefferson City, Missouri. She's employed as an elevator operator in a commercial building near the old Edison Brothers building on 3rd Street in Alton, Illinois for a number of years. She and her husband made a decision to allow her to become a full-time homemaker uh, for uh, their sons. During the same time, she and her husband would help uh, their sons, along with the help of their sons, built their new home. Mary's early life became a member of Quinn Chapel AME Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. Upon moving from her, uh, move, uh, moving with her husband to Alton, Illinois, together they joined Allen Chapel AME Church. Later, she and her husband became charter members of the U Unity Fellowship Church in Guthrie, Illinois. Mary was honored with the Living Legend Award from the Coalition of Concerned Citizens in 2008. James graduated from Vashon High School in St. Louis in June 1935. He was a 1939 graduate of Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, with a BS degree in education. He received his master's degree in education from the University of Illinois in Champaign in 1948. James was the first person to pledge for the Omega Psi Phi fraternity at Lincoln University. In addition to being the Lincoln graduate, he was also inducted into the Hall of Fame and received their Distinguished Alumni Award. James began his career in education as a teacher, a coach at Garfield High School in Mexico, Missouri. For 38 years, he's employed at Alton School District as a junior high school teacher, a coach, junior high school assistant principal, junior high school principal, and administrative supervisor principal of elementary schools. He served 10 years with the district as an assistant principal of Alton High School and assistant to the superintendent of schools. He spent many years planning and implementing the school district desegregation plan. 2006, the library at the new Alton High School was named James M. Bailey uh, Library in his honor. James was elected to city council as the first African-American Alderman for the city of Alton, where he served 10 years. He was also appointed as the first African-American Comptroller of the city of Alton for six years. He was active in many organizations, and one of which he co-founded the Elijah 
Lovejoy Memorial. James was a charter member of the Unity Fellowship Church and was formerly a member of the Allen Chapel AME, where he was an active member and served as a trustee and a treasurer. He received many awards throughout his career, such as the Brotherhood Award, Alton's Community Citizens Award, the Lovejoy Human Rights Award, also the Urban League Award. Uh, left to cherish the, both their memories are their two sons, Dr. James ba uh, Bailey and, their, and the Honorable Duane Bailey and a host of other family members. Members, that includes our journey motions. Let's go ahead and serve the city well. Thankful for all the work that those who work for the city, our police and firefighters, our public works, uh, keep the city running from water and power all the way through our park system. Thank everybody. This meeting's adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving, happy Hanukkah, and uh, take a hike this weekend so you can walk off some of that turkey.